Thank you, Lauren. It's kind of interesting to be up here with Lauren because she got to see me naked yesterday. <laughs> Which reminds me, you should all buy calendars. I'm not in the current one, obviously, but, but you should all buy calendars because that helps support the conference. I want to thank, yes, I want to thank JT. Yeah, come on. I want to thank JT and the conference organizers for putting this together. This is kind of a new experience for me. I do a lot of speaking on gay rights issues, and I go to all different kinds of places, and I often find myself in settings where I'm surrounded by religious people. I actually did a, an event this past summer. It was a retreat for gay Catholic priests. I know some of you think that's redundant. Uh, <laughs> It was actually a really wonderful experience, and I can talk to you about that later. But I'm often requested to come speak in front of Catholic audiences, and about a month ago, I was invited to the University of Dayton, which is a Catholic school in Ohio, and I think I saw some people with Dayton t-shirts on over here, yes. Okay, so I was at the University of Dayton, and true story, I, I arrive in Dayton, and within 10 minutes, the weather service declares a tornado watch. And my friends think this is hilarious because I'm speaking at a Catholic school. <laughs> and they start sending me texts. God knows you're coming. <laughs> and what was really funny was this was not the first time that this had happened to me. I had done, seriously, I had done a marriage debate in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And I checked into my room and the room phone rings in the hotel. And I think this is weird, because people usually call me on my cell phone. And I answer the phone, and they say, uh, Mr. Corvino, this is the front desk. The tornado sirens are going off. We suggest you either get in the bathtub or get in the closet. <laughs> and I thought, this is a joke, right? And they're like, no, the tornado sirens are going off. So I got in the bathtub. Um, <laughs> I want to talk to you today a little bit about how my experience coming out as a gay person relates to my experience coming out as a non-believer. And in order to do that, I need to share with you a little bit of personal history. So part of this talk is going to be a little bit personal, partly because I think telling our stories is something very important that we do, not just for other people in terms of putting a face on the issue, but also for one another. And so part of what I want to share with you is that I was not always a religious skeptic. In fact, at one time in my life, I was a candidate for the Catholic priesthood. That is not a Halloween costume. In 1988, at the age of 19, I was accepted into the Capuchin Franciscans, a Catholic religious order, and I planned on becoming a priest. This picture was taken in 1989, and one of the interesting things about this is I was here serving at the mass of a family friend, and this was a, at the mass of a wedding of a family friend. This was a wedding uh, for some people that we knew. And I was really nothing more there than a glorified altar boy. But I had on more lace than the bride. <laughs> Which is perhaps why it was not surprising when later that year, just a few months after this picture was taken, I came out of the closet as a gay man. And the re general reaction to that was, duh. <laughs> It's like, John, you would serve mass, you would dress like Cardinal Richelieu. What were we supposed to think? Um, so yes, nice hair too, by the way. Um, so I, in 1989, I was accepted into the order. For the first time in my life, uh, first of all, for the first time in my life, I was being confronted with questions about sexuality because I was about to vow myself to a life of celibacy, and this is something they want you to think about before you vow yourself to a life of celibacy. This is a good thing. Also for the first time in my life, I was surrounded by other gay men, including openly gay men in the seminary, people that I knew within the order, who would discuss very candidly and frankly their experience uh, as gay people, and this was very, very frightening for me because I realized that this thing that I had 
denied for a while that I was trying to push in the background that I wasn't confronting that I would have to confront. And I was supposed to move in with the Franciscans later that summer, and I had a lot of guys within the order say, John, you know, take some time on the outside. Uh, you, you, know, this, you do not need to make this decision. You've, you've got time. You should, you should consider other options. You should date. You should do all these things. And that's what I did, and I left the order. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to a Catholic college with a philosophy major. What the hell am I going to do? Uh, so I decided to major in philosophy and become a philosophy professor. And I continued to think a great deal about religious issues while I was doing this. It's funny, when I eventually gave up my religious belief in the mid-90s, I had a lot of people say to me, but that must have been really, really strange for you because you used to take religion so seriously. And I would always say to them, yes, I still take it seriously. That's why I'm an atheist. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't one of these people who was comfortable, comfortable just going through the motions, just showing up for mass because that's what the people in my family did. For me, it was really important to think about these things carefully. And I'm often reminded of the words of the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, where he says that religion is like wholesome pills for the sick, which when swallowed whole have the virtue to cure, but when chewed upon are cast up again without effect. <laughs> I pretty much chewed on the pill until it dissolved, and there I was. Um, so here I was. I, Started my graduate work at Notre Dame. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, I said, this is not for me. Got out of there, went to the University of Texas at Austin, and started working on a doctoral dissertation in ethics. In 1992, I was asked to give a talk during our Gay and Lesbian Awareness Week, and I titled that talk, What's Morally Wrong with Homosexuality? Uh, and I continue to give this talk today, 18 years later. Here's a picture of me in 1993, still have bad hair. Um, 1993, giving this talk at Coe College in Iowa. Um, and I've been doing this now for over 18 years, so my talk is now old enough to vote. <laughs> and pretty soon it will be driving across the border to Canada to drink. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about my experience delivering what's morally wrong with homosexuality. Because what I was trying to do in that talk, this was the early 90s, I was living in Texas, I was hearing a lot of horrible critical stuff about gay people, and I wanted to respond to it. So I said, I'm going to look at the most common arguments against homosexuality and subject them to some critical scrutiny. And I would go through the arguments one by one, religious arguments, harm arguments, nature arguments, and so on, and respond. I had no idea that this would lead to a side career for me. People heard about the talk, they started inviting me to other schools, then they heard about the talk, they invited me to other schools, and so on. Now I do it at about two dozen places a year. But one of the important things I've learned from this that I've drawn now to my work as a skeptic and as a um, proponent of skepticism is that I realized when I started doing this talk there were two important things I was doing, and they were equally important. One was that I was responding to people's arguments in a clear and rational way. And we as skeptics, and however you identify as a skeptic, we do this, right? We look at the arguments, we respond to them. But the other important thing I was doing, and this was especially important in the early 90s, is that I was putting a face on the issue for people. I was standing up on stage, and for many of them, this was the first time they heard a gay person that identified as a gay person talk about being gay. I mean, you know, this was not, you know, Ellen had not come out of the closet yet. Elton John was still bisexual, sort of, kind of. Um, <laughs> not that there aren't bisexuals, not that I don't believe in bisexuality, but for some people, it's a sort of way of kind of testing the waters. I'm not quite ready to say I'm gay, and that was true for Elton John. So we did not have the kind of visibility as gay people that we do today. And so for many people, just having a gay person up there speaking was a big deal. And I think that where we were in 1992 on the gay issue, in many ways we are today on the skepticism and atheism issue. That for some people, just being able to talk to a non-believer and have them answer questions and, and realize that we don't have flames coming out of our mouths or something like that is a big deal for people and is an important part of what we do. In addition to doing the talks, I also started to 
do... Um, uh, one other thing I want to say about this. I, I would go to very different parts of the country. I said I started out in Texas, and I, I went to Iowa, and I did a lot of talks in the South. In fact, I still do a lot of so talks in the South. Um, I also would do talks in the part of the rural Midwest. And I have to say, the rural Midwest is a lot scarier than the South, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Because with the South, there's a kind of veneer of politeness on the bigotry, right? So, <laughs> You're going to hell. Now have some tea. <laughs> when I would go to rural Michigan, other parts of the, it was not the same veneer of politeness. It, it came right at you, right? So I would continue to do this, continue to sort of be an evangelist, if you will, for, for gay issues. And I don't want to take anything away from Sam Singleton here, but, but you, you could, you, using that term. Um, and I also started doing debates on same-sex marriage more recently, about 2004 or so, started doing these. And I often end up doing them with Glenn Stanton from Focus on the Family. In fact, I've done that here with Glenn Stanton, and there was, there was actually a clip from us that was on the Christian Broadcasting Network that was filmed uh, at Missouri State. Here I am with Glenn Stanton. This is in um, uh, Westminster, at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, so not too terribly far from here. And I remember when I got this picture, Glenn said, I ought to caption this picture, God, save me from your followers. <laughs> because it was one of these rare moments where I was really losing my cool with him, and I don't often do that. We actually have a pretty friendly relationship. I know, we look like a charming gay couple, don't we? Um, <laughs> We're having issues, though, I've got to say. Um, <laughs> this is actually us in front of Flannery O'Connor's house. At one point, in our, I, I learned that he, like, like, like me, um, had a real fondness for the, the, writing of, the writings of Flannery O'Connor, and we were doing a debate in Georgia, and we decided to go to Andalusia, her house there, which was a kind of interesting experience. People often ask me, how is it that you spend so much time hanging around people in the religious right. I spend a lot of time with Glenn Stanton. I'm working on a book with Maggie Gallagher of the National Organization for Marriage. How can you, as a religious skeptic, spend so much time with the religious right? And the answer to that question is very simple. I drink. <laughs> now, the answer to that question, actually, to give you a serious answer to that question, a big part of it for me is the understanding that we have to live in the world with these people. We have to share the world with these people. Um, they're not going to go away as much as some days we wish they would go away. So I want to make a little bit of effort to try to understand where they're coming from, what makes them tick. And some of them are actually, generally speaking, decent people to be around, decent people to live around. And I've developed a reputation within the gay community as a kind of conciliator, which often gets me a lot of criticism. You know, people think of me, I've even been called a kind of Uncle Tom for my willingness to work with the other side. And there will be a panel later today on confrontation versus accommodation, which I'm participating in, which I'm looking forward to. But part of what I'm trying to do there is to recognize, look, there are places where we will not find common ground. Either one side or the other has to give up fundamental beliefs. We're not going to agree here. But there are places where we can make progress. And let me give you an example. Recently, there have been these horrible reports of gay teen suicides as a result of bullying and harassment. And I've had a number of people within the evangelical community write to me and say, John, look, we really want to help with this because we think this is terrible. We think every child is a child of God, worthy of dignity and respect. We think it's terrible that these kids are being harassed. But we can't give up our fundamental beliefs that homosexuality is wrong. What can we do? do is, it, is there no place where we can assist you? And I say, well, you could shut up. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I said, look. Yes, there are things you can do consistent with your beliefs. You can turn up the volume on the love your neighbor message and turn down the volume on the God's plan for marriage message. That would have two very important effects. One, it would be more consistent with this gospel that you're very fond of. And two, it would actually help the cause of gay teens not feeling so marginalized, not feeling so horrible. And so it's that kind of work, saying, look, 
I want them to change their views, but they're not going to all change their views, and they're certainly not going to do it overnight. In the meantime, can we make a little bit of progress? All right, well, if I'm so interested in being that kind of conciliator, in trying to work out those sorts of, I don't know if you want to call them compromises, but those attempts to find common ground, what's the big deal about the atheism stuff. Why, why would I even get into talking about this? Because a lot of people have said to me, John, if you want to be really effective within the gay rights movement, since you apparently have this great dialogue with religious people, you should probably turn down the volume on your atheism. And I've said to them, well, I'm not sure I can do that. And I'm not sure I can do that partly for reasons that stem back to things that I believed in when I was still very religious, having to do with standing up for the truth, having to do with witnessing to beliefs that are important to me, having to do with calling things as I see them. All of these values that were part of my upbringing as a Catholic, all of those things that were important to me at the time I wanted to become a priest, you know, in terms of moral values, they're still very important to me, and I can't keep quiet about this. And so I find myself often in situations coming out as an atheist. And I will tell you that this is often, not always, but often harder than coming out as a gay person. When I say that in front of gay people, they get really mad at me. They say, you know, people don't get like beaten to death for being atheists. Yes, they do. <laughs> You know, people don't get kicked out of the house. Oh, yes, they do. All right, so don't, I mean, I'm not playing the game of, you know, my suffering's worse than your suffering. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in terms of my own personal experience, John Corvino, I often get more dirty looks when I talk about being an atheist than when I talk about being a gay person. And what's more, I often get those dirty looks when speaking in front of gay people. Another minority which ought to have a little bit more sensitivity about this. And I'll tell you a story. I was doing a, a keynote address at a gay pride event out in western Michigan, not far from Grand Rapids. And there was a, a dinner reception afterwards, and this person came up to me and she said, Oh, Dr. Corvino, I'm this great fan of your work. I love your column. I read it all the time. And at one point, the discussion turned to religion. I forget why. And at some point, I said something about being a skeptic. Because I try to make it a point now, if people don't seem to know this about me, to, to bring it up because I think it's important to witness to that. And she said, skeptic as in, I said, skeptic as in I don't believe in God. <laughs> and there was a pause that was about that awkward. <laughs> where she looked at me as you might look at someone who has just been covered in dog shit. And then she composed herself and she said, well, I guess I still like your columns. <laughs> and I thought this was very, very interesting. And it was interesting to me for a number of reasons. One is that her enjoyment of my columns hinged upon my sharing her belief in God. Two was this person I was talking to was in fact Jewish which is not a tradition that's known for proselytizing and for being in people's face too much about converting and so on. So th there were a lot of things that, that really bothered me about this. But I thought it was important to keep going and, and to keep talking about these things and even to start doing talks and debates about these things, partly because I began to worry more and more about the ways in which religion would license really bad beliefs about all kinds of things, including LGBT rights. The problem is, is that once you open the door and say, well, you know, it's okay for you to believe this stuff as long as it's deep in your heart and so on, and it doesn't matter, yes, there's a leap of faith, but it doesn't matter what kind of evidence you have for it because it means something to you and that's great for you. The problem is that once you open the door to people believing things without evidence, they don't just believe good things without evidence. They sometimes believe bad things about evidence, without evidence. Thank you. Thank you.
And yes, there's a lot of very inspirational stuff in the Bible about love your neighbor and, and, and standing up for the downtrodden and so on, and I'm glad that that inspires people and motivates people. But if I could use a technical theological term, there's also a lot of crazy, awful shit in the Bible. <laughs> And once you start giving this kind of an authority of, you know, this book is special, not just special because it's part of our cultural tradition, but special in that it's got God's stamp on it some way, what happens is that people start feeling that they've got infallible backing for their fallible human prejudices. And they then use that to license all kinds of really problematic beliefs and otherwise intelligent people start giving really bad arguments. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to go to the coming out analogy. Otherwise intelligent people giving really bad arguments. I mentioned uh, that I was briefly a graduate student at Notre Dame. This was back in 1990. Not briefly enough, let me tell you. I got out of there after a semester. That was not a good place to be as a gay person in 1990. Especially since I had just come out the year before, so I was really somebody who was trying to get his voice on this. And I very quickly became labeled as the gay person. There was one other guy, Mike Miller, who used to, to speak on these issues. But to the point of where I'd walk across campus and people would point. <laughs> or I'd be in the cafeteria and say, oh my god, he's eating a hamburger. I thought they were all vegetarians. Um, <laughs> and people would stop me sometimes and say, you're Mike Miller, aren't you? It's like, no, I'm the other homosexual on campus. <laughs> and I got really tired of people being, being people's show and tell exhibit, so I left. And I went down, I went to Texas. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> But I went to Austin, Texas, and Austin, Texas in 1991 was a pretty cool place to be. Um, so I would um, go around at Notre Dame, and we were trying to get a gay and lesbian group going on campus. And we were told we could not have that group on campus because that would conflict with Catholic teaching. And over and over, the administration would go out of its way and say, you cannot have this group. It conflicts with Catholic teaching. Now, we did have a Muslim student group on campus. <laughs> and a Jewish student group on campus. Muslims and Jews both deny the divinity of Christ, which, when I went to Catholic school, was a very important part of Catholic teaching. <laughs> it wasn't just optional. But this was an example of how people would be dramatically inconsistent in Otherwise intelligent people would be dramatically inconsistent. And then when you started talking to them about religious freedom and say, well, wait a second, I thought we believed in freedom of religion and, and so on, and what about a, a diverse campus and so on, then they would start pulling out natural law. And this is something I talk a lot about in What's Morally Wrong with Homosexuality. Um, this claim that homosexuality is unnatural, how many of you have heard this before? <laughs> yeah, all of you, okay. So what does it mean, and why does it matter? And the why does it matter part is the part that people often miss, right? Because think about all of the unnatural things that you've done today. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You woke up this morning. Did you wait for a rooster to crow? No, you probably set an alarm clock. Alarm clocks, not natural. You came here to Springfield. Some of you walked. Many of you drove in cars, not natural. We're in a building, not natural. You're listening to me on a microphone, not natural. We're being air conditioned by these weird vintage radio looking, I, <laughs> what the hell are those? <laughs> they're cool, but they're not natural. <laughs> Think about all of the ways that we as human beings alter nature, but when people say homosexuality is unnatural, that's supposed to stop the conversation somehow. So a big part of what I would try to do is to say, OK, what do we mean by this? Why does it matter? In my usual talk, I go through a bunch of different meanings. I just want to share a few favorites with you before I then draw this back to the atheism stuff. 
So the people who tell me it's not natural because animals don't do that. Two things. First, since when did animals start providing us with our moral standards? Especially in the area of sex. Think about that the next time you're humping the sofa cushion. Animals don't provide us with our moral standards, and if they did, of course, homosexuality would not be a problem, because not only do animals engage in homosexual behavior, some actually form same-sex pair bonds. And people are always sending me links to studies about this. Gay penguins in Central Park. You can Google it, I'm not making that up. Lesbian seagulls. Lesbian seagulls. What do they have, like short haircuts and Birkenstocks? I mean, what does that mean? It's all very interesting. And then people say, no, no, it's not natural. That's not what we mean by not natural. It's not natural because it violates the purpose of the sexual organs. Yes. I actually had somebody stand up during one of my talks. I'm not going to tell you where, Kentucky. Um, <laughs> stand up during one of my talks. Like, I have one question for you. Can two men make a baby? <laughs> hmm. No. And if you have to ask me that question, sir, we've got bigger problems than I can solve. No! <laughs> Two men cannot make a baby, but is making babies the only purpose for sex? I mean, straight people often have sex even if they don't want children, don't want children yet, don't want any more children, or can't have children. Why? Because we recognize that sex has these other functions of intimacy. And then people want to say, no, 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 it's still not natural for a very simple reason. I say, what's that reason? And they say, plumbing. I say, plumbing? Yes, plumbing. The parts don't fit. <laughs> and when people tell me the parts don't fit, all I can say to them is, yes, they do. <laughs> How do I know? Well, If they didn't, people would try it, it wouldn't work, and they'd go do something else. <laughs> I mean, think about what that scenario is going to look like. Just imagine this for a second. Would you? Oh my god, the parts don't fit. What are we going to do? I don't know. Do you want to go bowling? Sure, this is not working. <laughs> I would actually have people during the Q&A portion of some of my programs say, well, of course it's wrong because And I say, if you're doing it this way, you're doing it wrong. What do you want me to tell you? <laughs> I began to understand why these people are always so obsessed with male homosexuality. I mean, what does lesbianism look like to these people? It's like... At this point, we no longer have an argument. What we have is a panic, right? And we can do better. And I think a really important thing that the skeptics movement does is to say, look, let's calm down, let's get, and let's start thinking about things a little bit more clearly. But as I mentioned earlier, part of our getting to the point where we are as effective as we want to be involves coming out. And one of the things that I know as a gay person is that coming out is not a single moment, it is a process. It is something that happens over and over again. And I've noticed many parallels, many analogies between that process for a gay person and that process for me as a skeptic. And I want to talk about some of these. There are going to be some disanalogies as well, but I thought it might be useful. I was just sort of jotting these down, thinking about ways in which there are important similarities here. So. We're talking about something that has deep personal significance to people. Now, obviously, my being gay is significant to me in a different way than my being a skeptic is. But both of them 
are, in some sense, an important part of my identity. And related to that, in both cases we notice how people can be very good at keeping separate sets of mental books. Do you know what I mean by this? When I was, a, when I was in high school, back when I wore the lacy getup for real, not for Halloween, um, this is what I would say to my priest confessors when I, I am basically straight, but I have gay feelings. I didn't have any straight feelings. <laughs> and I was a reasonably smart person, and a person with gay feelings but no straight feelings is gay. But by not letting the ideas touch, I didn't have to draw the relevant conclusion in my mind. And I think we do that a lot in religion, and I think for those of us who came, went through the process of coming out as skeptical, we had the ingredients we needed to make the argument to say, you know what, this doesn't add up, but we don't let the ideas touch because that's going to get kind of awkward, that's going to get kind of uncomfortable. And that leads me to the third analogy, which is the possible bad reaction that we're going to receive. And particularly when you're young, that bad reaction can include being cut off from your own family, the people whose support and confidence you depend upon in the world most at that stage in your life. And this is very difficult. And I heard stories yesterday of people who have been you know, estranged from their families as a result of their skepticism. And this is one of the ways in which the skeptical community and the LGBT community have something in common and that makes us different from certain racial and ethnic and religious minorities. Think about this. You know, Jewish children tend to be born to Jewish parents. Black children tend to be born to black parents. Right? People are not generally kicked out of the house because their parents figured out that they're black. Right? <laughs> any kind of parents can have gay kids. And any kind of parents can have kids who grow up skeptical. And thus, we can't count on our parents for the kind of wisdom and experience and support that certain other communities at least have built in. Now, there are other things that make the situation worse for them. I'm not doing the comparison of whose suffering is worse. I'm simply saying that there are analogies and disanalogies here to learn from. As a result of coming out as a skeptic, like coming out as a gay person, in some people's eyes, you will be marked as permanently flawed in some way. There is something, this is the reaction I got, the person looking at me like I was covered with dog shit. There's something about that that just, I'll never look at you in quite the same way again. And this is something that we have to confront and deal with. I think in both cases, we have a need for community, a need for people to turn to, to for support. I think the LGBT movement has a longer history of doing this than the skeptical movement, and I think the skeptical movement really needs to catch up on this, and I think this is a very good start. So awesome on that, because I think that events like this start to provide that kind of community that's very important, especially for people who are really struggling with these kinds of changes in identity. I think in both cases you have to be prepared for what we think of as dumb questions. Now, it's true, there are no stupid questions, just stupid people who ask questions. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Look, anytime, well, maybe I do mean it, but anytime, any, no, seriously, anytime that somebody sincerely is trying to wrap their mind around something, making an effort they want to understand, I say, great, I want to help you understand. Right? I don't get very many dumb questions, quote unquote dumb questions about gay stuff anymore. Occasionally I do. But back in the early 90s, you better believe, I was getting a lot of those questions. I mean, people would say, so as a gay man, what role do you play? <laughs> what role do I play? I'm Faye Dunaway and Mommy Dearest. What do you mean? <laughs> No wire hangers ever! Um, and I, you know, okay, and I think we don't get that so much as gay people, but I do get it as a non believer. So I had somebody say to me not long ago, You're an atheist. That means you hate God, right? <laughs> and at that point, I want to say, You're a moron. No, but I don't say that. No, it doesn't. 
Why would I hate God if I don't believe in God? That doesn't make any sense. But a person making an effort to understand, okay, I'm going to make an effort too. I think we need to be prepared to do a lot of work to demolish myths about uh, who we are and what we believe. Because there are a lot of these myths out there. There are a lot of um, really bizarre and foolish views, and we have an opportunity now to dismantle some of those. I think sometimes in the coming out process we do what we gay people would refer to, back in the old days anyway, I don't know if anybody uses this term anymore, dropping hairpins or dropping bobby pins, which is you're not sure whether you should come out to somebody, so you give a kind of little hint, you drop a bobby pin. Um, and the idea you know, is like, hey, how about that movie Brokeback Mountain, that was kind of cool, wasn't it? <laughs> to see how people might react. And in my early days as a skeptic, I used to do this. I walked into my dissertation advisor's office one day, and you know, he, I, he, I knew he was somebody who went to church regularly as a Catholic. And I said, you know, I, I just read this um, article by William Rowe, and I know that you know, Rowe used to be a religious believer, and now he's an atheist, and that must be a really hard conversion to make, huh? And my dissertation advisor turned to me and said, no, it's not that hard, I did it. <laughs> I said, but you go to church. He's like, yeah, I like the music. <laughs> and that you know, started a conversation for us. But it was this kind of like, I needed to drop the hints first. I think the way we say things, the way we come out, matters. I think that personal confidence in this area matters. And this was something that I learned Interestingly, when I was at Notre Dame and I took a course with Al Plantinga. How many of you know the name Al Plantinga? Okay, so Al Plantinga does a lot of work on the problem of evil, a well-known evangelical Christian philosopher, actually just retired, is in his 70s right now. And Plantinga would say the most bizarre things, but he would always say them in a deep, authoritative voice, <laughs> and so everyone took him seriously. And, and really, I mean, I, I'd be at these talks, and someone would ask this question, and it was just sort of devastating. So, so planning, are you believe that the explanation for natural evil in the world, like earthquakes and so on, is demons and, and angels? I mean, do you really believe that? You know, isn't that a crazy view? I don't think it's a crazy view. <laughs> Why would anyone think that? My friends don't think that. And you know, the way he would just answer with such confidence, they were like, oh, I guess so. I guess maybe it's not a crazy view. Yes, it is. <laughs> but the confidence he would express really made a difference. I know that in my early days as a person coming out as a gay person, I would shake, literally shake, when I would tell people that I was gay. And anytime anyone could actually talk about that without wavering, without shaking, it made a whole lot of difference to me. And I remember, you know, after I had left the Catholic Church and was living in Texas and still felt some kind of need for community, I started going to a Unitarian Universalist church for a while. And I remember at this Unitarian Universalist church there was the point where they would give the church announcements, like every church does, and this little elderly woman like, gets up to the podium, she can like, barely see over the podium, and, and she starts giving the announcements, and at one point she says, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender group will meet afterwards in the parish hall for donuts and coffee. And she didn't trip over any of those words. And for me, that was amazingly powerful, because I had all, you know, just assumed, like the elderly church person, I'm not going to be understood here, and just the way we speak about these things, it matters. And finally, there's the issue of integrity. I said to you earlier um, that I, I do these talks and debates and that part of what I used to do in the talks as a gay person was to give people an example of what a gay person looked like. And people don't need that as much anymore. Now I think people need a lot more of an example of what an atheist or a skeptic looks like. And so when I do my debates on the existence of God, I talk a lot about just what that means to me 
and also what it doesn't mean. And that's a way of witnessing to my reality, witnessing to who I am. So I say, you know, I'm an atheist. It doesn't mean that I never believed in God. It doesn't mean that I don't believe in anything bigger than myself. I believe in a world that was here before I got here and that will keep being here after I leave. It doesn't mean that I don't believe in morality. It doesn't mean that I don't believe in truth and these other values. It doesn't mean that I don't believe in integrity. And this is really important because I think, going back to what we were talking about a moment ago about myths, is that one of the myths is that, well, once a person is an atheist, all this other stuff, you know, they don't believe in morality, they don't believe in justice, they don't believe in integrity. And yet, I think for many of us, the very reason we're here and the very reason we're doing the work that we do in the skeptics movement is precisely because of our moral values. It's precisely because we want to express what is important to us as a matter of integrity. And I have had people in the gay rights movement say to me, John, I understand that this is important to you, but don't you think that you could just maybe not talk about it so much because it could hurt the gay rights movement, it could hurt the bridge building work you've done. And I want to admit something to you. It could. There are costs there. There's no doubt that there are potential costs. I may lose certain readers who will no longer read my column. I may lose my effectiveness with certain members of the religious community but I cannot remain silent. I cannot remain silent, thank you. I cannot remain silent because I know what happens when people think they have infallible backing for their fallible prejudices. I cannot remain silent because I do believe in truth. I do believe in integrity. And I cannot remain silent because even though we need those religious allies in the gay movement, and I very much believe that we do, we also very badly need a dose of religious skepticism in society. That's why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. That's why I'm here. And I thank you for being here to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I actually have time for questions, do I? Uh, oh my God. You know, it, it, oh my God, he said. Um, I, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, philosophers are usually very bad about time because we, you can't even say good morning. Like, what is morning? And is noon morning? All right, so, by the way, that is a Halloween costume. That's my closing slide. It's actually the same stuff, but this was like two years ago I wore it for Halloween. Um, all right, so I have time for questions. Uh, would love to hear from you. The same thing, just come on down and line up, and if we could please keep the questions short. Don't hog the mic. No one likes a mic hog. Don't be that guy. All right. Um, all right um, well, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you is, um, like, my mother, she, uh, she said she took a class, like a psychology class, and um, she, has, she used to be kind of anti-gay, but now she's, uh, you know, decided that, you know, homosexuality is, you know, fine to some extent, that relationships should be approved. And, um, you know, she said the reason was she's seen evidence in psychology that there was, you know, like, you know, maybe some kind of a genetic component to it, or maybe it, it's not exactly like a choice to be gay. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm sure you as a philosopher know that that's kind of commits the genetic fallacy. Yeah, it commits some fallacies, certainly. Um, so you want me to talk about that briefly? Uh, well, yeah. yeah or, sure, sure. Oh, sure. No, look, I don't know what to do with bad arguments for good conclusions. So some people want to support gay and lesbian rights because they think it's genetically hardwired. I don't think it makes any difference one way or the other whether it's genetically hardwired. I don't think that's how we judge the moral status of an action. 
so every time somebody starts talking about that, I start pointing out to them, well, it shouldn't make one difference one way or the other, but it's one of those things that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on because if it makes some people like your mother more likely to support our rights, I've got other things I could do than, than fight bad arguments for good conclusions. So. Well, it was a wonderful uh, uh, lecture. I loved it. Um, like you, I've had to come out twice in life, first as a gay man and second as an atheist. And one of my pet projects that I've been doing for a long time is trying to find a non-religious source of homophobia, and I have not found it yet. Do you have any comments? Um, yeah, there's not much. I mean, a lot of homophobia, particularly in this country, comes from religious sources. There are philosophers, like Michael Levin, for example, uh, has an argument against homosexuality not based on religious sources. And it's not like Robert George or John Finnis who claim that they've got an argument not based on religious sources, but really in the background religion is operating. In his case, I don't even think he's religious at all. So, but, but you're right, it's quite rare, it's quite rare. Uh, so you talked a lot about similarities between coming out as uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and uh, coming out as a non-believer. What do you think some of the differences are? Really good question. And you know, part of the why I didn't talk much about that is it was hard for me to sort of very quickly come up with one th what those might be. But here was one that I came up with. For me, coming out as a religious skeptic was much more of an intellectual process. Um, that when I was in graduate school, I was really thinking about the arguments trying to solve the problem of evil. I was really thinking about the arguments for the existence of God, and I very quickly went from being a Catholic to a sort of generalized Christian, to a sort of generalized theist, to an agnostic, to an atheist. Um, and that was very much an intellectual process. The coming out process for me as a gay person was much more visceral and emotional. There are certain things stirring within me that I'm trying very hard to ignore and can't. That's the main one. Great follow-up question from this one, too. Um, judging by your canter and such, I'm assuming you're much more comfortable yourself from coming out of the closet from gay. But to borrow that same phrase from your getting the point of atheism, did you find that same transition to be true of being even more comfortable with who you came to be today? Yes. Uh, every time we say out loud these things, I think it becomes easier to say them. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to exercise that ability of saying these things out loud. I also find myself doing things um, as a skeptic that I used to do as a gay person, I don't do as much anymore. You know, there are always those moments where you just don't want to get into it. You know, you're, you're sitting on the plane and the person next to you wants to talk to you. And they're like, oh, where are you going? Springfield. Why are you going to Springfield for a convention? What kind of convention? Um, <laughs> and you know, there are days where you want to have that conversation and days where I just don't want to get into it, right? Um, and I used to find as a gay person, that a lot of the times I would just, you know, when I'm going to speak somewhere, what are you speaking on? I just say ethics. Because not that I was you know, afraid to be out as a gay person, I was out as a gay person, but I just didn't feel like getting into it right then. And more and more I say to myself, look, if there's no real cost in getting into it with this person on the plane, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll shut the person up, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> you know, it's important for people to see that we're here and I can't do that if I'm keeping quiet about it. So yeah, I did have that process. Hi, you mentioned um, the, uh, I believe it was the young woman who was a fan of your blog. Yeah. And that when you told her that you were an atheist, that you had a reaction like that. Um, I've, uh, I'm an atheist and I've attended events with the gay community and I have, uh, there's a gay bar in uh, St. Louis that I go to, a friend with a bartender there. And uh, I went to uh, several events with both gays and atheists. And I was wondering what your perception is with the reciprocal acceptance between the two groups are. Wow. Um, I'm going to try to answer that question candidly with the preface that my experience is not necessarily everybody's experience. But in my experience, the general population of gay people that I've talked to about this issue are often more uncomfortable with it about all more uncomfortable with the skepticism issue than skeptics are with the gay issue. Yep, yep, yep. And I think, yep, everyone said, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> um, so I'm not the only person who's had this experience. And I think that part of it 
is just as a kind of political strategy. Gay people are saying, okay, we want to be all respectable now and we're starting to be treated as respectable and here you get up, John, and you put your suit on, you got your hair combed nicely and so on, and they're going to look at you as respectable. And then you mention that you're a heathen. Um, <laughs> And you're going to ruin it. Um, and, and so, and I think that this is true of you know many minority communities that say it's like you know, at least we're not like that. At least we're not like those atheists, or at least we're not like those transgender people, or at least we're not. Uh, you know, and I think it's awful. Um, and I think those of us who are in positions of privilege, wherever that, whatever that privilege comes from, have a moral responsibility to use the power we have to make changes around that. Um, when I returned back to college to get my second degree in neuroscience, um, I found the best program at a Jesuit university, and as an atheist in a Jesuit university, do you have any advice? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the first thing I want to say to you is go for it. You know, um, look, one of the things I, I've made clear to many audiences, and I'll say this to you today, I did not leave the Catholic Church because of a bad experience with the Catholic Church. I understand that people do have bad experiences with the Catholic Church. There are things about the Roman Catholic hierarchy that I find appalling. But my experience of, I went to St. John's University as an undergraduate, I started my graduate work at Notre Dame. My experience, and my experience in the order and my experiences more recently, have often been very positive. Um, why is that? Well, partly it's because there's the church and there's the church, right? There's the hierarchy and then there are the people on the ground. But partly for me with Catholicism, it's also because I thought the Catholic Church was one of these traditions that tended to take the big questions seriously, that had this intellectual tradition and thought, yes, that, there, that reason and science have a role in all of this. And for me as a philosopher, there was something very valuable about that. And partly for that reason, when I go to Catholic campuses or I'm in these kinds of environments, I often feel very much at home because my tendencies as a philosopher seem to fit well with that, even though I reach different conclusions than they do. So I, I say go for it at, at a Jesuit university and find like-minded people who can be your allies. Um, uh, I've heard the argument before that in part of your, spe uh, your speech, you use the phrase coming out. And I've heard that phrase is uh, homophobic in itself. Uh, because it, it looks at the community as a uh, gay community as something different and not looking at them as part of society and on Yeah, clear. it raises a very good question. When we talk about coming out, coming out of what and going into what, it does set up this notion that there are boundaries and walls. But let me tell you, it's a metaphor, and like all metaphors, it's imperfect, but it's a metaphor that felt very apt for me, partly because I very much was building walls around myself as a gay person to keep enemies out, but also keeping my friends out, because there were parts of me that I didn't want anyone to see. And so coming out of that, it very much did feel like a coming out. And of course now I pose for nude calendars, and I'm <laughs> hanging all out there just as God made me. Um, it was really funny because I thought I would like prepare for this, like you know, go on some kind of great like exercise regimen or something for two months. I didn't. Um, so like two days before, I just like stopped eating. <laughs> and I went out to dinner with some friends and they're like, why aren't you eating? I said, I'm fasting. And they said, why are you fasting? And I said, for the poor souls in purgatory. I just want to say that you looked fantastic. Yes. And you he was only wearing a hat. <laughs> I'll let you just imagine where the hat was. I wanted to touch on, you mentioned that you, in, in the past you have um, gone off, as you put it, um, with uh, arguments with Glenn as far as focus from the family. And as an atheist, arguing with someone about religious issues as far as like, does God exist, I find it much easier to be calm and rational and just yes. go over the arguments. But whenever I go over the arguments uh, against gay marriage, for instance, or against gays in the military, I find it much, much, much harder to stay rational and level-minded. And I find myself getting very angry sometimes. Yes. And I wanted to know how you approach the situation when you do get angry yeah. with Glenn and how you avoid getting angry in the first place. Uh, I drink more. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, look, part of it is the experience of being calm and rational and just doing it over and over again. Part of it is sometimes like, okay, something is pushing my buttons right now and I need to take just a few breaths. 
And part of it is that sometimes I find I need to go do something else for a while. So I'm actually going to be taking a break from the debates with Glenn for a while, partly because you know, I think we've kind of hit a wall in certain ways. Not that I'm doing this to convince him, and this is really important. When we debate the people on the other side, whether it's on the gay issue or on the skeptical issue or something, we're not doing it to convince them, although it would be nice if we convinced them at some point. We're doing it to convince the audience in the room, and the audience in the room tends to be much more convinced if we can keep a level head. So keeping that in mind helps too. Uh, can, can you discuss confronting more than one privilege at a time? Um, as in, you know, how do you have a discussion with a homophobic faith head? <laughs> how do you have a discussion with a homophobic faith head? Um, you know, part of it is that I don't often put it in terms of privilege because I know that homophobic faith heads don't respond well to that language. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, my tendency as a philosopher, and it's not just on these issues, it's just more generally, um, you know, there, there, there are two ways to attack a deductive argument. You either attack the premises or you attack the validity of the argument. You say the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. And for whatever reason, I'm just more inclined to do the second. I'm more inclined when I can to say, look, let's suppose we accept these premises, but your conclusion doesn't really follow. And, and I would just sort of do that bit by bit on the different issues and recognize that I'm not going to address everything all at once, and that addressing everything all at once might lose my audience, so I take it apart bit by bit. Um, when I was in high school, me and my friends fought for like an, you know, an atheist school group, and we fought for like a, a gay group, and um, we had asked the principal, and we just kept getting turned down, and we had said, why? And he's like, it's not part of the school curriculum. We said, then why are there two Christian groups? Because that has nothing to do with the school curriculum. He said, no offense to anyone in this room, I will not allow that faggot organization in my school. Now, how, I mean, I've still got friends that are going to that high school. How would I tell them to fight that and get them to say, hey, that's not fair? I would be on the phone immediately to the ACLU. Um, or whatever local organization is going to be most effective in that. And you know, it's a terrible, awful thing, but now is an opportune time to be addressing that sort of thing because with all of the evidence we have right now of the effects of bigotry in schools and the effects of bullying in schools and what that does to people's sense of self and what that does to people's sense of whether they can even keep on living in the world. Uh, it is a moral imperative that we address those sorts of things. So thank you for standing up and please do. That's exactly um, where my observations are going. I was a public school teacher for 33 years and I had so many, many, many junior high kids come through my classroom who were questioning their sexual identity. So I applaud you for your courage, your integrity, and your compassion. But let me tell you that my entire life, I've been a seeker. As such, I came to my skepticism late. During that process, though, I questioned all sorts of prejudices. I, I said, um, yeah, I can tolerate anything but intolerance and homosexuality. Well, the Harvey Milk thing converted me completely. And after that, my students found a very safe place in my classroom, and they all knew that. The, la the, the second observation, my son is 18, he's a senior this year, and the only conflict he's ever had in school was about his non-belief. He is also a baptized Catholic, but he says, Mom, I can't do that anymore. I do not believe in that. So here is a suggestion for you. With your great talent, you must begin to cultivate principal, superintendent, and teacher conferences, and give presentations to those people to save our kids. Thank you and bless you. Thank you, and I do want to point out that over the 18 years, I tend almost always to speak at 
colleges and universities, not at high schools, um, and there are sort of obvious reasons for that. The only time I've ever spoken at a high school was St. Paul's School in New Hampshire, which is this very elite prep school. It's where John Kerry went to school. It's that kind of, you know, Oak, Oak Hallway kind of thing. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly open to speaking at those places. And, you know, since I can't be everywhere, I would encourage you, if you want to, pick up a copy of the DVD and give it to your local school board. Um, I would encourage you to do that. They also make great gifts for Christmas or the <laughs> Feast of the Unconquered Sun or whatever you celebrate. Um, but, but in all seriousness, um, yeah, I would like to be more of a resource for high schools and so on because for a long time, below college level, people were just too nervous on this issue and I think maybe now the time is ripe to, to do that. So thanks for your encouragement. Last question. Um, I was just, uh, until just recently, living in uh, Columbia, Missouri, which is a very nice town, but um, that's not important. Um, anyway, uh, as you were, you were talking, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> you were talking about, um, you know, going through the process of coming out twice, and I, I did that actually three times, but that's not important, in uh, Columbia. Um, and uh, anyway, just recently, the, the important part is just recently, um, I moved back to the area to... Uh, take a job in Branson, and uh, since coming back there, I have encountered the extremely, <laughs> the, uh, the extremely, <laughs> the, the extremely conservative Christian culture, um, especially amongst my colleagues, and have uh, sort of found myself uh, retreating back in. And so I was wondering if you had any uh, suggestions. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> no. Uh, um, no, my suggestion is, it was a very quick, simple answer, to find allies and to remember that allies need allies too. I mean, that we, that we need to prop ourselves up and sometimes that's a slow process. And it can be discouraging if you're used to being in a place where you're more open and you're more comfortable and you retreat to a place where this issue is not as open. But you know what? That, that more difficult place is also the place where our voices are needed that much more. So it's good that you're there. Thank you all so much. You're all terrific. Thank you. Okay, now is